Good evening. We are glad that you're back. This is um, two in a row for me. I uh, was able to speak last Sunday morning uh, in Elizabeth, and uh, my sister-in-law, Wanda May from Florida, was uh, there, and today my sister-in-law, Pat, is here. Um, it's a good thing. I got good in-laws, and um, I hope you do as well. Uh, glad that you're back tonight, and Hey, tonight's lesson is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Paul and what it means and what he means when he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. I was standing up here, I had the perfect illustration, and I'm looking at y'all wondering if I should tell you, but I, I think I will. I think you'll appreciate it. I think you'll understand it. Uh, I can remember uh, when I had first obeyed the gospel had gone to, for what it was worth, I'd gone to the public library uh, about um, one to two hours a day, just kind of trying to find my way through, uh, trying to see if I thought it made sense. I'd, I, I'd seen a couple things on TV and thought, ah, you know, I want to see what the Bible says about Jesus. I hear all these people talking, people in the neighborhood and other people. And I was a million miles away, but I just wanted to kind of check it out and so I actually ended up uh, obeying the gospel, and um, I was walking home uh, from the public library after I obeyed the gospel, and a car uh, pulled up beside me, and uh, I recognized uh, the young men. They were from another city, and uh, they uh, asked me for um, some things. I'll leave it at that, and um, I looked at them, and... Um, realized that uh, I was no longer living that life and said, uh, hey guys, with all due respect to you, uh, I'm serving my Lord now. And uh, I remember, I'm only saying that because I, you know, you think about being ashamed and you think about courage and it hits you at different places in different ways. And so I took a couple more steps and the guy pulled up to me and he rolled the window down and he said, yeah, 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 we, we actually heard that, uh, you were starting to grow pretty big, so you decided to go into the church for a cover. I, and I looked at the guy, and I said, look, dude, there's a lot of things to cover, but playing with God's not one of them. Now, here's why I said that. Not that what I was doing was that gigantic or dangerous or anything else, but that was a, that was a crossroads for me. That was a place in my life where my past my future and where I was collided. And for what it's worth at that moment, I came out on the side of the Lord. I hadn't planned it. I didn't know what I was going to say. I wasn't, it wasn't a fearful thing at all. But it was a thing that somebody was asking me about my faith for the first time. And I, and I say that because depending on where we are and how old we are and how much we talk to people and our personalities... Shame comes in different ways. When you think of shame, most of the time we think of something that I did wrong and was exposed. We all would agree with that, shame. But sometimes shame comes from I didn't have correct information or I miscalculated something and treated somebody in a way or said something that I shouldn't have said because I was wrong. I, I don't feel guilty about it, but I do feel shame because I shouldn't have said what I said, even though I thought I was correct at the time. So we, we, we've all experienced some of that. So depending on where you are in your faith, whether you are growing in your relationship to figuring out who the Lord is, whether you're already his and you're growing, whether you've had stumbles, we all have that question, are we ashamed of the gospel? What does that mean? I mean, to be fair, in a setting like this, I doubt very seriously if any of us would raise our hand and say, I'm ashamed of the gospel. And yet, tomorrow, this evening, in just a few moments, we could be in a totally different setting, and all of a sudden, it's not so cool to talk about the Lord. It's not so cool to talk about your faith. Matter of fact, you'll find that in a lot of other things as well. You'll even find that in relationships. You'll get around people and find out that it's not that good of a thing to talk about the fact that you love your wife. 
It's just the world we live in now. So when we think about being ashamed of the gospel, all I really want to look at is Paul and see if we can get some kind of understanding of what he means when he says that. And hopefully, 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 regardless of where you are in your walk and your faith, it will help us all to draw just a little near to our Lord, be a little more grateful, be a little more thankful, which allows us to be just a little more courageous. Because that's, that's the interesting part of faith. Everybody that we know who likes us and loves us, tells us and encourages us to obey the gospel because it's a good thing. And then we realize that not everybody in the world sees it that way. Matter of fact, uh, sometimes you could even be in a classroom in college with 35 other people and a professor and you're odd person out. Not because you're odd, but because you've obeyed the gospel and you love the Lord. You could be at a company event. You could be at a sporting event. I remember, I, I, I don't know, you just hear things differently when you obey the gospel. I, 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 I don't ever remember consciously remembering people taking the Lord's name in vain before I obeyed the gospel. And then all of a sudden it became commonplace. I mean, it became so commonplace that the people who actually took it in vain, I was surprised they even knew his name. But they knew where to plug it in, though. I mean, it's kind of interesting when you look at people and look at the life we live and where we come from. And So if we can walk away this evening, I, here's always our goal, I think, when we come together. I, I, I think we want to leave a little better than we came. And I don't mean rah, 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 everything is fine, let's just go jump off a cliff. That is not what I mean at all. But if God's word is preached and is preached sincerely, then we should all come a little bit closer to our relationship with God, whether we need to eventually repent, whether we just need to grow in his grace and mercy, whether we need to be thankful, whether we need to be more active. Whatever it is, we should grow a little closer to our Lord. That's the goal, I think, any time that we come together, obviously, is to worship God. But if we can't worship God and grow nearer to him, then I'm not sure how we're worshiping God. So tonight I want to look at a little bit on what it means uh, to... Be ashamed or not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here's a, here's a thought for you. I saw a young lady that I had gone to school with since grade school. Me and some friends were at an event. She was there. Hadn't seen her in a long time. I mean, we were buddies. We were good buddies. I mean, friends from kindergarten on. Yours truly walked up put his fingers around her eyes and said, how are you doing? And she said, I don't recognize the voice. And the wise guy that I am, I said, you should be able to feel my hands and know who this is. You've known me forever. <laughs> A couple guys I was with from school, she turned around and looked at me and said, I don't think I know you. And I looked at her and said, I know I don't know you. <laughs> she was not who I thought she was. I thought it was Paula Page. It was not Paula Page. It was a girl that looked like Paula Page. Uh, so make a long story short, you'll love this. She bailed me out, though, because all my friends were making fun of me. Oh, sure, Harry, there's Paula. Go, hey, Harry, go get Paula a hug. Go get Paula a hug. You know, they were really giving me a hard time. And uh, she saw them giving me a hard time as I crawled back over to where I was and she came over and said, hey, I just want you guys to know that uh, even though he didn't know me, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And I thought, okay, she's going to help me save a little face here. Uh, but uh, shame. I, you could have bought me for a wooden nickel. Didn't last long, but for that moment, it was brutal. Awkwardness. And sometimes it's because we just don't have the right perspective. Sometimes it's because we just don't understand the setting we're in. So here's Paul. He's writing to church in Rome, which consists of Jews and Gentiles. You just got to love Paul's letters. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, 
and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of the name among all nations, that's us, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's, here's a staple of Paul. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. But that, that seems to be a natural breath and heartbeat for Paul. Thanking God for the saints that he interacts with. What a lesson for us to be grateful and thankful for each other, to pray for each other. Why? Because the real facts are, when you stop and look at how many people actually have a precious faith in the Lord, it makes us a more, more precious unit. I can still remember when I obeyed the gospel at Dover, we went to this little tiny congregation. I mean, there was all, I mean, on a good Sunday, man, there was 28 people there. I remember the first time I went to Harding University. I don't know if I heard one lecture. I don't know if I sang one song, but I saw 5,000 Christians, and I was good to go. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I thought we were the only ones. I didn't know. But you and I both know now that people love the Lord, what? The world over. It's hard to go to a country. Now, this doesn't mean they don't need help. doesn't mean we don't need missionaries. But the real facts are there are people who love the Lord all over the world. Paul thanks God for them through Jesus Christ. He says, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, the gospel of his son, without ceasing, I mention you. Always in my prayers, he says it again, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart some spiritual gift. Jeff spoke about that last week. To strengthen you. To strengthen you. What do you mean, Paul? To strengthen you in your faith. Your faith in Christ. Your faith in God. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Isn't that a good, good statement? Mutually encouraging each other? That's what we do with our best friends, isn't it? We, we encourage them, they encourage us. That's really the truth in faith. We encourage each other. And so we should. It's a great place to be. Actually, encouragement is one of those things that I, I, I just, I like. And I like it because I've had been very fortunate. I've had so many people at different places in my life, some I still know, some I haven't seen in a long time, who've encouraged me uh, along the way. And I have tried to be grateful and tried to return it uh, to other people. Mutually encouraged by each other's faith, by yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brother, that I have often intended to come to you, but this far it's been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. You know why Paul wants a harvest? Because he realizes by preaching the gospel and planting the seed that people will obey it, and it's a part of his harvest, his spiritual harvest. And then he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Paul's going to preach the gospel no matter where he goes. And then he has this great line. You just got to love it. This actually, by the way, who's written, the, who, 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 who's written a, a, a major paper using um, what's the, accurate uh, punctuation and documentation? The, 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 the number one thing you have to have is what to get started. A thesis sentence. It's, it's, it would be the equivalency of shooting an arrow, a bullseye, a heartbeat. What's the one thing you want to get across if you don't do anything else? What are you going to build on? Every commentary seems to say that's exactly what we have right here in verse 16. So here's how Paul sets the stage. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay, Paul, so help us out here. What do you mean you're not ashamed? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Why is that, Paul? For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
dunamis, power. Here's the outline. Uh, almost every commentary I read all had the same outline. And here it is. It's, it's, it's eight major blocks. The book of Romans seems to be the book that uh, a lot of people really, really fall in love with and it changes their life. Um, someone once said that if you would sit down and quietly read the book of Romans from beginning to end, a minimum of three times, and did any study at all, that it probably would change your life more than anything else. That's how much is involved in the book of Romans. So here's an outline of Romans. The gospel as the revelation of the righteousness of God. That's the first 17 verses that we just read. The next three chapters, it says God's righteousness in his wrath against sinners. Three to four, the saving righteousness of God. Five through eight, hope as a result of righteousness by faith. 9 through 11, God's righteousness to Israel and to the Gentiles. 12 through 15, God's righteousness in everyday life. The extension of God's righteousness through the Pauline mission, and then finally the summer of the gospel, and again of God's righteousness. Here's what uh, the ESV study Bible says about verse 16. Paul explains why he is so eager to preach the gospel everywhere. The gospel is the saving power of God in which the righteousness of God is revealed. Because of their lack of size, fame, or honor in the Roman quarters of power and influence, Christians might be tempted to be ashamed of the Christian message. But Paul says it is nothing to be ashamed of, for it is in fact a message coming from the power of God that brings people to salvation. Jew first indicates the priority of the Jews in salvation history, and their election as God's people. The role of the Jews is a major issue in Romans, as seen especially in the discussion that Paul has in other ch chapters. Greek is not limited here to people from Greece, but refers to all Gentiles. The power of the gospel The righteousness of God, we talked a little bit about this morning, that the righteousness of God incorporates things, but the real, the real, the real central thought is, is that God is holy, and so therefore something must be done to eradicate sin because it's happened. And because God is holy, he's able to eradicate that through his very own son who is pure and holy for paying the price for those who can't pay it themselves. And then those who obey it by faith and obey the gospel are able to walk in righteousness because they now take on the Christ in their life who is the Son of God who came to save the world for those who had faith in him. That's, that's, that's the main theme of what he says there. Uh, here, 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says that he who knew no sin became sin for him, uh, righteousness of sin for our sake. I want you to listen to how they try to help us understand what that really, really means. The Bible says it in 12 words, 10 words, 9 words. But it's easy to follow. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The verse is one of the most important of all of Scripture for understanding the meaning of atonement and justification. Here we see that the one who knew no sin is Jesus... And he, God, made him Christ to be sin. That means that God the Father made Christ to be regarded and treated as sin, even though Christ himself never sinned. We see that God did this for our sake. That is, God regarded and treated our sin, the sin of all who would believe in Christ, as if our sin belonged not to us, but to Christ himself. Thus Christ died for all. And as Peter wrote, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. In becoming sin for our sake, Christ became our substitute. That is, Christ took our sin upon himself as our substitute, thereby bore the wrath of God, the punishment that we deserve in our place for our sake. Thus, the technical term for this foundational doctrine of Christian faith is the substitutionary atonement, that Christ has provided the atoning sacrifice as our substitute 
for the sins of all who believe. The background for this, now listen to this. I love Isaiah 53. I, it's, just, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite chapters, and I, just for me, I, I love reading it. I, I don't know of any other passage that really helps me uh, with the Lord's Supper. But listen to Isaiah 53 and how he weaves that into 2 Corinthians 5.21. The background for this is Isaiah 53 from the Greek Septuagint, translated of the Hebrew Old Testament, which includes most lengthy and detailed, the most lengthy and detailed Old Testament prophecy of Christ's death, which contains numerous parallels. Here they are. Isaiah's prophecy specifically uses the Greek word for sin five times with reference to the coming Savior, the suffering servant, in just a few verses. Here they go. Surely he has borne our griefs. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He shall bear their iniquities. He bore the sin of many. In a precise fulfillment of this prophecy, Christ became sin for those who believe in him, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This means that just as God imputed our sin and guilt to Christ, he made him to be sin, so God also imputes the righteousness of Christ, a righteousness that is not our own, to all who believe in Christ. Because Christ bore the sins of those who believe, God regards and treats believers as having the legal status of being righteous. The righteousness belongs to believers because they are in him, that is, in Christ. Therefore, the righteousness of God, which is imputed to believers, is also righteousness of Christ. That is, the righteousness and legal status that belongs to Christ as a result of Christ having lived as the one who knew no sin. This, then, is the heart of the doctrine of justification. God regards believers as forgiven, and God declares and treats them as forgiven. Because God the Father has imputed the believer's sin to Christ, and because God the Father likewise imputes Christ's righteousness to the believer. And then here's the, one of the last verses in Isaiah 53. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many to be accounted righteous. That's Isaiah talking about Christ's coming and the power of the gospel. I think one of the reasons why Paul was not ashamed of the gospel is Paul never, ever, ever forgot his conversion. If I was a guessing guy, I would say he probably told it more times than it's recorded in the book of Acts. But we know the story. Acts 9, he repeats it in 22, and then I think he repeats it again in 26 to King Agrippa. He's talking to very, very powerful people about his conviction in the Lord. We're going to paraphrase it. You know the story. Paul is, has papers. He's taken Christians. Matter of fact, we believe he was there at Stephen's, stoning, because he thinks he's doing God a favor. He's struck blind on the way to Damascus. Can't hear, can't see. He's told that he's supposed to go somewhere and somebody's supposed to take care of him, Ananias. And Ananias really doesn't want to have that much to do with the guy. He's heard of his reputation. The Lord tells him, no, no, he's going to be a vessel of mine. And Ananias listened to him. Paul goes, ask him, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Paul rises with faith in Christ, wash away his sin, and then goes and starts preaching the gospel. Goes first to the Jews. Has a hard time with it. They stone him. They beat him up. They have him arrested. They have him arrested, and he's in chains. And before the council, he's telling his story already. He's already telling them about his conversion to the almighty, true, living God. He goes on, he does other things, he goes other places, they beat him up again, they find out he's a Roman citizen, he goes to Rome, he gets before King Agrippa, and all of a sudden, guess what Paul's doing? He's telling his story. Now here's a verse that I find very, very, let me see, I, I, I just, this little teeny tiny verse, um, I, I, I don't know that I recognized it before, I won't say I didn't recognize it, but um, I, I don't know that I saw it in the same light. Paul was before the council. He's speaking in Hebrew to Jewish people, and he goes down, and he's retelling his story, and it says that when he was in the barracks, that the Lord stood by him, and here's what it says in Acts 23, 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. 
for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And that's all it says. We know later that Paul goes there through the scriptures, convinces them that Jesus is the Christ. But he also tells them his personal story because of the impact that it's had on his life. That's one of the things about conversion that is so empowering to people sometimes that we don't know. They see a change in somebody or they see somebody obey something and to them, they go, wow, you got to be that, that guy, that girl, they, and matter of fact, sometimes it's the other way around. People know you, but they don't know you. But the way you handle your business and the way you interact with them, they go, oh, I thought they went somewhere because they're different when they come in. They're honest. They treat me with respect. Oh, yeah, sometimes we're late, but they don't get all over me. Why? Because sometimes you handle yourself differently and people notice that. I was, uh, I don't know if I told you guys this. I told Darlene about 50,000 times, but I was in Giant Eagle um, two weeks ago, and I was uh, getting something for Darlene, and I saw a little kid go by. His mom had him in a stroller. Did I tell you the story? Mom had him in a stroller, I mean, in a, in a cart, and they, I was looking for the right size eggs, and um, the little guy leaned out the side when his mom was fine. He looked at him, and he smiled. He's probably three, four. I looked at the little guy and I smiled back and I got my eggs and they went about another three feet and he leaned around again and then he said this. He looked up and he said, Mommy, Mommy, I like that guy. I like that guy. Now listen to me, folks. I, I realize that in this day and age that you don't just want to take any kid and put him with a stranger and I wasn't trying to take the kid home or anything like that. But for that little dude to acknowledge me I told Darlene, I'm done. I could have just left the groceries there and went home. I was good. I, I floated out of there. Now, here's what I come to the conclusion. I think I know why kids, I say this sincerely, I know why kids like me. I really do. Because kids are like grandparents. We only pay attention to the ones that are ours. We don't really pay attention to anybody else's. But if you do, they will recognize you and they will like you. They will acknowledge you. That's just how it works. See, sometimes we see our grandparents and we slobber all over. We're in the grocery store. We knock down this lady, 83 years old, trying to get home in a hurry to watch the game. It's just the way we are. We see little kids and we're going, man, why don't somebody do something with them in the middle of the aisle? Now, if it's your kids, you go, no, we can't have those yet. But not so much when it's somebody else's little kid. So, I'm, so what's, what's your point, Harry Oakley? My point is, is that we need to pay attention to people if we're going to impact people. Paul, I believe it's his conversion and his conviction. Do you remember Paul says that he's the least of the apostles? Paul never, ever forgot the Lord's blessing in his life, regardless of what was going on around him. I'm not suggesting that's easy. But I am suggesting that Paul did that. Never, ever, ever forgot God's grace and God's mercy to him personally. That's something we can all do. You don't have to be a Paul to be appreciative and grateful for obeying the gospel and knowing that the Lord is in your life. Paul writes to Timothy. I think it's his last letter. His time is drawing nigh. His days on earth are short. Listen to what he says about being ashamed. One of my favorite passages, I'll, he talks about his grandma. He talks about his mom. What a legacy to have faith like that in your family that you can look up to and come, come after. He says, for this reason I remind you, to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, 
but share in suffering of the gospel of the power of God who saved us and called us to be to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began in which now been manifest through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you, may, that you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy, his last letter to Timothy. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God to save. Matter of fact, Paul actually would say it in another way. He says, don't be ashamed, but really what he's saying is what? Be strong, be powerful, be proud, be grateful for what you are in the Lord. Jesus says in Matthew, it's Matthew, it's Mark, I, let, me, let me look in Luke. It's, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is one of those verses that turned my world upside down. Uh, Matthew 9 I'm going to start at verse 23. He's just, for, he, he's just asked them who men say that I am. And they say, well, they say you're one of the prophets. And some says you're Elias. And he goes, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter gives him that great confession, thou art Christ of God. And Jesus tells him in Matthew that it's good for you because God revealed that to you, not flesh and blood. And then he goes on to tell them about his impending death, which they don't understand, but they will later. But then listen to what he says here. And he said to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father with his holy angels. But I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come in. How to be ashamed of Jesus, to have faith and to be courage in Jesus. Sometimes we really should be praying for strength, shouldn't we? I mean, we're all at different places. There were times when I prayed for strength. There was time, I still do. Lord, the next time I'm in that situation, give me courage to say something. When somebody says something that, that I could say something and I don't. We're all that way. We all, we all need to grow. We all need to pray. And then there's other times where maybe I said something that I shouldn't have said and it's already out. And yet we know that God's grace and God's mercy is sufficient and we know how much he loves us. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Romans, we're wrapping up. Listen to, listen to what Paul says a little bit further in the book of Romans. He says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, how then will we call on him in whom we've not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, the Lord has believed, the Lord who has believed what he has heard from us, that's Isaiah 53, 1. And then here's a, here's, here, 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 here's a statement that is small, that's piercing. For faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Sometimes I think people think that if I can just ball up my fist and just grunt a little harder and try a little harder, that somehow my faith will be okay. If you could do it that way without the Lord, you wouldn't need the Lord. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All the times that we get to hear it preached, all the times that we get to read it on our own, it increases and encourages our faith. That's the one thing that we got to be grateful and thankful for, is it not? I mean, to be fair, you're like me. I know you are when Roger preaches. The one thing, there's a lot of things you might have to worry about in this world, but whether or not we're going to get the word is not one of them. Some other things, but not that. Romans 10. And then the other part of Romans, we're winding down, Romans 6. Here's how Paul explains it when he's trying to Help them understand what it means to have faith and obey the gospel and the new life that they are to walk in. We mentioned it just a little bit this morning. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in the newness of life. Paul, why are you not ashamed of the gospel? Number one, I know what it's done for my life. Number two, I know what it can do for the whole world. Why? Because it's the power of God, and it's God's love, and it's the only thing that makes John 3, 16 as great as it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If there's any way we've said anything tonight that can help you make a decision on serving your Lord, then allowing your faith to become active, there could be no better time than May 5th, 2019. I can only say this about obeying the gospel. I don't know anyone that I've met who've obeyed the gospel that said they wish they would have waited longer after they obeyed it. And yet at the same time, to be fair, it's always a personal decision. So although we, like Paul, encourage people, at the same time, we give you your space. Why? Because you are you and we are us. And yet at the same time, at the same time, please remember that it is the power of the gospel of the Lord. He sends his only son to take your place so that you can be in him so that we can have a right relationship with God. That's the life that Jesus gives when he says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So why don't you have that life tonight as we stand and sing the song of invitation?